I don't think you have any idea, well, you might, how thrilled I am to be here. I have looked forward to this week for a long time to be with you live this weekend, to be with you live NCC or onliners, wherever you are. I don't even know if that's a correct phrase, NCC onliners. <laughs> Sounds like a ship, but, I, but, but there you are. You're in Osaka and in Paris and in Rio and in Calcutta. You're all those places, and here we are together in the spirit of Jesus, and I am so grateful that we are here together. I, uh, I bring love from Ruth, and uh, whenever, I, whenever I talk about you, I always brag on you. I just do. And I brag on you because this is a totally selfish moment for me. I, I come here and hopefully bring something, but I always walk away more filled up than when I came. And so, there you have it. Well, let's, let's get after this. I love the name of this series, Stirrings. I love that. And here we have the Feast of Pentecost, historically on the Jewish calendar, and on the Christian calendar, for that matter. And it has to do with this Feast of the First Fruits, the First Harvest. It's seven weeks and one day after the first day of the start of Passover. So you've got this 50 days. That's, that's where Pentecost comes from. The five, like the Pentagon. Pentecost comes from that idea. And I have a dream for this Pentecost week and our time here. And it's this. That we would open our hearts to reflect on the glory of God. The glory of God. What is that? How, do, how does that affect me? It sounds like a conceptual, like an idea. It is that, but it's more than that. What does it look like, particularly, what does it look like to discover glory and experience it? So in these next few moments, I want to sort of do a tapestry, if you will. It'll have a fair amount of scripture in it. It'll have some personal experience in it. And I want to bring two of my friends along for the journey. One would be Simon Peter, you know him, and the other one would be my friend Howard. Some of you have heard me talk about Howard, but I want to introduce you to him more specifically during our time. So, for followers of Jesus 2,000 years ago, the day of Pentecost was a, glan, was a, was a grand slam homer at Nationals Park. It was, it was that kind of event. Jesus had been with his disciples for six weeks following his resurrection, talking to them essentially about one thing, what he had been talking to them for three years about, and that was the kingdom of God. What is this kingdom like, this upside down, inside out kind of place? What does the king look like? And Pentecost that spring, because this was celebrated every year, Pentecost that spring, when Jesus of Nazareth died and rose from the dead, was like no other. And Jesus is here saying to his disciples, something's coming. The followers didn't know what. So here's how it unfolds. And Jesus tees it up this way. And you, you know these verses, many of you do, but I'm going to read a fair amount of scripture in this time. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he's hanging with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He's been talking about the kingdom. It's a legit question, not a bad question. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority. That's a very particular word. That authority word means just that. It's the status, the office. But you will receive power, different word, from which we get the word dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love this little exchange because they say, so when do you think? You know, are we there yet? Are we, you know, what about dates and times? <laughs> this is a fourth paraphrase of scripture. Jesus says, fellas, it's not about dates, it's about dynamite. I've been waiting a long time to say that line. I just wanted to put that out there. 
So big things are coming and you need to see and feel. This is essentially what he knows and what I think he's saying. Big things are coming and you need to see and feel and experience my glory. God's intent from the first, when Pastor Mark started this series, he talked about creation and the spirit hovering over chaos and creating order. From creation forward, God always wanted to be with. That's like a Chicago phrase. You want to go with? And it, he, he wants to be with us, right? And he always wants our best. When I read this book, he always wants me to be effective. He always wants the things that I am about to be most life-giving. But we wander off, just like the Israelites. We wander off. We say, I do it myself. I'm like a three-year-old wanting to pour lemonade. And I do it myself, then we clean off the wall and we keep going. That's sort of, you know, he always wants the best for me. And always, in this book, he would do something, something, to remind us, to call us back, to show himself. As Pastor Mark says, sometimes he shows up, sometimes he shows off. That whole concept. So Israel had several somethings in their history. They had the Red Sea parting. That was big. Then they had the law giving on Mount Sinai. That was big. But one event captures me in the Old Testament, perhaps more than any other, as it relates to Pentecost. It's when the Ark of the Covenant was returned once Solomon had built his temple in Second Chronicles, and we'll read the text. Once he'd built the temple, they brought that piece of furniture, if you will, that box that characterized and held the presence of God, the glory of God. And they put it in the holiest place, this little space in the, in the temple. And this passage in 2 Chronicles 5, I sort of see, I love that trailer, by the way. That, that's a terrific trailer. Uh, I see this passage I'm about to read as a, sort of a video trailer for Pentecost, Okay. It reads like this, 2 Chronicles 5.11. The priests then withdrew from the holy place after they'd brought the Ark of the Covenant. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. All the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Haman, Jejuthun, their sons and relatives, stood on the east side of the altar dressed in fine linen, playing cymbals and harps and lyres. And they were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. That's a lot of brass. This is not just those trumpeters when the president got 120. It's a lot of brass, right? The trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raised their voice in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good. His love endures forever. And I don't know what that Middle Eastern melody, that Hebraic tune sounded like. But then, when they did that, the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Now this was a place that Solomon had built for God. That's a little interesting. Why don't I build a place for God, right? But, but when they sang together, when they praised God with one voice... When that happened, it's almost like Yahweh, who's over here in the Holy of Holies, can't stand it. And he comes busting out of there and fills the whole space with himself. That's what Pentecost is. It's the God who is in us by his spirit. And when we are in that moment of glory, he comes busting out, if you will, and fills the whole space. God moves when we praise him. And he lives in people's praises. We know that. We say this all the time. He lives in the praises of his people. But there's something about that, of God filling the whole space that exhibits his glory in a deep dimension. Moses, he knew the importance of presence and glory. Exodus 33, Moses has this special tent. You can read it. I'm not going to read it to you. Where he goes and he meets with God, has conversations. And when he does that, it says the cloud settles down outside there. Well, he's had, he's had sort of a bad day because he came to get the tablets on the mountain and while he was doing that, they were partying down below and it wasn't a great party. They weren't worshiping this God, they were worshiping one made with their own hands. And so he's in a dilemma and this is the conversation. Moses said to the Lord, Exodus 33, 12, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, 
Teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you. I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So what is glory? Literally, the Old Testament word is a settling in. It's taken from the idea of armament that is put on, and it has to do with weightiness. It has to do with something that is heavy. The glory of God is not flimsy. It's not smoke and mirrors. The glory of God is solid, rock solid, and deep, and rich. The word is a word kavod. And, and if you don't have the glory, it's called ichavod, ichabod. Some of you know that name. The glory has departed. In the New Testament, the word is a Greek word, doxa, from which we get doxology, Right? And the hymns of the early church were called doxologies a lot of time. I, I'm, I'm raised in a Pentecostal church. I'm raised with gospel songs. I'm raised with every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. But as I, as I grew in faith and learned some other songs, I, I really like praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we named that. That was named the doxology. I, um, I think about the weightiness of the glory and the honor and the splendor of it. When the glory descends, when the glory is there, it's like the membrane that separates my humanity and time and space from the eternal gets dissolved and we experience that glory. Glory is God's palpable presence, not an idea, not just a theology or even just a feeling. And Pentecost was a glory time. No more local, no tabernacle, no temple, no city, no Jesus even in the flesh. It's Jesus in your flesh and in mine when Pentecost comes because he invests himself. It's the handoff for the good news kingdom for Jesus. There's no plan B. This is a huge grounding experience for these people on that day of Pentecost. And what does that look like? Well, Jesus only gave them one instruction. Go wait. Keith Miller years ago, author of Yesteryear, said, uh, hell is waiting for something to begin and it never does. So here they are. They're sitting in this room waiting for something to happen. They don't know what. What did they do in those days? Maybe they recounted you know, like, what's, what's your favorite, what was your favorite miracle during those days? I really like the one where they extended the hand or somebody said, you know, the thing that I remember most, we were in that storm, Peter, and we were out there and Jesus came walking on the water and it scared the bejeevers out of us. And, we, and, 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 and you said, can I come to you? And it wouldn't be hard because the boat was like this. All you had to do was step out and you took about four steps and down you, and I can hear Peter saying, well, I didn't see anybody else getting out of that fishy boat. I, you, you know, I don't know that it was that but it had to be recollections imagine with me who you are in that room I'm going to imagine Simon Peter a faithful follower speaks what he's thinking speaks before thinking a lot of times he has just defended God a couple of months ago he had his sword he's not great with it but he you know he gives it his best shot he says I'll never leave you I will not deny you and then he does and the symbol of that is a rooster crowing. That, that's the rooster morning. That wasn't a good morning. But then there's that resurrection morning that he remembers where they run to the tomb and John outruns him, but he, he runs right in. And then there's that breakfast on the beach morning where the smell of baking tilapia floats across the water early in the morning and there's that restorative moment. And then on the day of Pentecost, with that as a backdrop, this happens. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? He, they're saying all these people are from the same county, right? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. They're pickled. They're sloshed. Schnockered. If you're in the Navy, it's... If you're in the Navy, it's three sheets to the wind. Whatever it is, that's what they are. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raising his voice, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose, only nine in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and I love the teaching that Pastor Joel and Ernest gave just a few weeks ago on Pentecost. It's the same Passage In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, speak out. Your young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy, speak into culture, speak my character, speak whatever it is that I call them to do. So physically what happened, it was a sight and sound moment. I mean, it was wind and fire. God himself, Ruth and I live in a place where sometimes we get 60 mile an hour winds. It's a big deal. I mean, it's a roar. And here it comes. And I'm thinking, how did the wind and fire work? Would it be like turning on a, a burner on your stove, you know, and, and waiting just a couple of seconds before you lit it? And it goes whoosh like that. Maybe it was that. I don't know what it was. We know that it was this reverse Babel effect. We know that it affected language because if you're going to prophesy, if you're going to be speakers of the good news, you need your tongue touched. You need your spe speech as personality. You need to express the person and personality of God. This is, this is 120 trumpets and all those voices raised all over again. This is good news going everywhere. It's interesting that we talk about words, and in a day of super sensitivity to words, it's, you know, sometimes in public speaking you get nervous. You say, boy, I don't want to say anything because somebody will be mad. You know, I'd got, it, we're, we're sort of in that moment, are we? But let me just say this. When you're praising God, when you're lifting him up, the only person that's going to get mad about that is the devil himself. That's, that's how we need to be able to see what it means to praise God and see his glory. So here are shouts and laughs and tears. This is the sound of a birthing room, okay? And he says they're, they're drunk. It's, it's only nine in the morning, can't be drunk. And then Peter the talker gets it right. He hasn't gotten it right a bunch of times before, but he reaches back and pulls out this 850-year-old prophecy and says, this is what's going on. So what's going on spiritually is that God's mission is to infuse people with himself, Equipping a good news army. The church is born. All of Jesus by the Spirit made available. All of Jesus' abil abilities, his prophetic insights, his gifts, his healings, his teaching, distributed through the church as he wills. And m my question is, if I were in that room, would I ever forget that sound? Would I ever forget that moment, that sight? Would I ever forget the feelings, ever forget the experience of being submerged, saturated beyond themselves in the spirit? Ever get away from the confidence born that morning? Ever get past that God did that thing with those people, a group of ordinary, typical people? They would never know on earth that we are here because they were overwhelmed with God's glory that morning. When the glory of God shows up, sometimes you want to shout. And sometimes when the glory of God shows up, you don't want to breathe. You don't want to take a breath for fear or concern that, that he or that moment might go. That moment changed everything in the future. 
I mean, we can go into church history, don't have time for this. The Great Awakening is in this country, all of those kinds of things. But this idea of prophesying, speaking the word, it's a broad concept, and you could do a whole series just on that. But there's also specific moments. I just want to share this little thought. Church planter, Urbana, Illinois, 100 people in the congregation, and um, a young couple came. He was in national law enforcement. We became friends, and I went to visit at their house. He wasn't there. His wife was at the door, and she said to me, you know, we're coming to church, but I have to tell you that I've been gone from God for a long time. You know, for, I just, I, I'm doing it out of, I don't know, out of rote or something, habit. She said, but it's been five long years since I uh, really connected with God. I said, well, you can come back. Just come back to, she said, I can't. There's an, imp- I just can't do that. I said, you can't. She said, I can't. That next week they showed up again came to the end of the message, I was just about done, and I started to close, and uh, it was a small congregation, so you could hear this, and a young man, a graduate student getting a PhD, sitting right over there, two rows behind where this couple were sitting, said this, he just said, I, the Lord, say this to you, five long years I have waited for you. And the hair, I, didn't, I had more hair then than I do now, but it just stood up on the back of my neck. And that woman just shot out of her seat and came. And I, I had some queries about, you know, is all this stuff real, this, these words and these words of knowledge, is that really work? And I was the pastor, but I was having some struggles. Some of you understand what I'm saying. And, um, but that moment changed everything. So this is my personal moment. 5,900 miles from Jerusalem to Washington, D.C., It's light years from that room in Jerusalem to the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. But an exchange in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in 1970 changed my understanding of Pentecost. Glory showed up. The Mayflower glory moment gave me my friend named Howard. This is how it happened. One Sunday morning, we're doing that church plant, got those 100 people in Urbana, Illinois, and an older couple came and sat in the back row after the songs had started. They were older, they were, he was 48. And you know, when you're 28, 48 is, you know, you're over the edge. And so he was, they were there. They sat through the service. When, they, when we got done, we prayed and they were gone. Somebody ran up and said, do you know who that was? I had no idea who that was. I had breakfast with him, found out who that was. His name was Howard Vincent Momstead. There's a picture that'll be up here of Howard. Howard, and I'm just going to read you from the website of the University of Illinois. You can go there and look at it yourself. Howard Vincent Momstead, faculty of the Department of Chemistry, University of Illinois, from 51 to 81, widely considered the father of modern electronic and computerized instrumentation in chemistry. Developed and taught both one semester and three week summer courses on electronic instrumentation, the latter financed by industry and the National Science Foundation, so forth. He's well known for his brilliant scientific intellect, nurturing personality, high moral standards, enthusiasm, creativity, and leadership in analytical chemistry. The world of atomic spectroscopy, that's light for scientific measurement, is largely a result of the many generations of students he has mentored. He wrote more than 150 scientific articles, 10 internationally used textbooks, sometimes referred to as high voltage Momstead by his chemistry students and colleagues at the University of Illinois, where his prolific ideas and energy were nearly legendary. I had no idea who I was having breakfast with. And I asked him this question, how did you happen to come to our little Pentecostal church? His story was this. He said, I'm on the National Institute of Health Advisory Board. Come here a couple times a year. I had read a book by a Virginia aristocratic white lady by the name of Sarah Patton Boyle called The Desegregated Heart. And it was the story of her journey trying to get involved in the civil rights movement in the 50s. And what happened was that she wasn't received well and she was rejected by her own people and she ended up alone 
and lost. In, in essence, she fell into the arms of Jesus. And Howard had read that book, and it so moved him that he wanted to be able to meet her. And he got here a day early. And back in the day when you had these things called phone books, he looked her up in the phone book in Arlington, Virginia, and called her and said, could you meet? She could. He flew his wife in that night, and they met her in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel. And this is what Howard said to me. He said, when she walked into the lobby of the Mayflower, a different presence came into that space. A different presence. And when I said, where did this come from at the end of several hours? She said, you need to visit a charismatic or a Pentecostal church. One of those who, who, who say, let's, let's do some of this and let's do some of this and let's see about all these gifts of healings and all of that. I visited his lab, whole wall. Whole wall of computers, he said, Dick, within a few years, this is 1970, in a few years, all of that will be in this. And that's exactly what happened. There was the day when he called me and said, I feel like I need to be baptized in water. Could you come to my home, uh, my summer home up in Lake Michigan? And I baptized him in Lake Michigan. And then there was the day he called me and he said, you know, that, that experience of Pentecost where they were overwhelmed with the Spirit and spoke in these other languages. He said, Dick, I think, I think that happened to me last night. I said, well, how long did that go? He said, two or three hours. He was a scientist on his way to discover Glory. We traveled to India together. We were in university settings where he gave his testimony and he had, he wasn't loud. He was a quiet, elegant man and he just, he just had such authority when he spoke because he had experienced the glory of God. He was bold and clear in his witness. One might call him prophetic. That's, that same presence that he found in Sarah Patton Boyle captured him in the Mayflower. It was a dimension beyond his intellect whether it's a fisherman in Jerusalem or a chemist in Washington, D.C. or University of Illinois, this same Jesus, the one that fills us full of his spirit, wants to show up in power, wants to show up in glory. This is the end of that webpage, University of Illinois. Momstead retired from the faculty at the University of Illinois in 1978, moved to Hawaii in 1981 to co-found the Pacific and Asia Christian University, renamed the University of the Nations in 1989. At the pinnacle of his stellar career, at age 56, Howard left to continue his discovery of glory in a whole new educational context, and he stayed there till his death at 81 years of age in 2003. Howard possessed a kind of elegance that, when touched by the glory of God, was magnetic. His voice was quiet, but it was bold. And sometime before that Hawaii move, he told me of an event in his honor in New York City. It was a two-day conference. He was getting an award. And he, um, his former students flew in. Chairman of chemistry departments, University of Alberta, University of Cluj in Romania, Athens, Michigan State University. They all came and they had read scientific papers for two days, and then came the black tie dinner at the end, and they invited him to speak and give a science talk. And at the end, he said, I just need to say this, that all of my career I have been discovering the creations of God. But a few years ago, I discovered God. And everything that I have and am and ever shall be, I owe to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And he took off his lavalier and put it down and stepped back. And that whole scientific conference came to their feet in a standing ovation. I think heaven came to its feet in a standing ovation. I had other scientist friends who say they never do that. Scientists never do that in those conferences. And man and woman after man and woman came to him and said, I'm a believer, I've always been afraid to sort of step out, but you have unlocked the door so that I can step into that space. Yeah, you can clap for that. Because... At the Mayflower Hotel, glory was in the room. And at the Americana Hotel in New York City, glory was in the room. So let's hear it again. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will speak, will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. When we discover glory and revel in it, invite it, make room as we sang tonight, the world hears God's voice in a different way. 
My prayer for us is that we would experience glory. My prayer for you and for me is that when we walk into any room going forward, that a different presence will come into that room. Let's pray. Father, here we are. You know us better than we know ourselves. Some of us would identify with fishermen and tax collectors and homemakers and others, and some of us would identify with chemists and attorneys and all of those things. But when we identify with you, when we praise your name, and you can't stand it, and you come busting out and busting in, if you will, to fill us full of your glory, help us never, ever to take that for granted or to get over it. And we stand on tiptoe this Pentecost week to see what it is you want to do next with us and in us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen.